good. <laughs> okay, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, welcome to Open Door Fellowship. My name is Amy Quinn. Um, if you're new with us this morning, we're very glad that you're here. Um, our lead pastor, Caleb Lynch, is finishing vacation with his family this morning, but he'll be back next week. Um, so Open Door is a family of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our desire is to know him and to make him known and to love one another deeply from the heart. And every week we get to open his word together and we believe um, that all of these things were written, it says in the book of John, so that we may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that by believing in him we may have life in his name. So we are in a new summer series that started last week. It's called uh, Pete's Tweets. Thank you, Caleb Smith, for that excellent name. It's a series going through the book of First Peter. And the idea is that these summer messages are meant to be short and concise little uh, standalone messages so that if you happen to miss a week or two um, here on a Sunday morning that it's okay, you can jump right back in. You haven't missed anything super foundational in the overall series. So before we get started, um, since Caleb Lynch isn't here, I think it's my job to give the, the sports report that he always gives. It's my understanding that the Suns are playing tonight. It's going to be three for three. I'm just confident of it. So what I know of the Suns, uh, in 1993, KJ was fast, Charles Barkley seemed a little full of himself, and Dan Marley opened a sports grill, so that's good to know. I actually really enjoyed watching them in 1993. I was in seventh grade, and they did some decent basketball that year, and so they inspired me to pursue my own career in basketball. So the following year in eighth grade, I uh, tried out for the girls' basketball team at school, and I made it. And thank you. Yeah. We were undefeated the entire season. We didn't lose a single game. We were so good that not everyone on the team even had to play. <laughs> My job was to sit on the bench and be ready the moment they needed me. And they never did. We were that good. <laughs> and we won every game, including the, um, the, um, the, the, the final one. And I was very proud to help earn that trophy for our school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was good. It was highlight a marker moment in my life. But I decided not to go ahead and keep doing basketball because... Um, you know, honestly, kind of just felt like it came too easy. <laughs> if I'm going to play a sport, I'd like it to be a little challenging. You know, I didn't even break a sweat the entire season. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I am excited about the Suns playing tonight. Go Suns, it's going to be great. And if I had to, you know, offer a word of encouragement to them, I would probably just tell them what Coach always said, which was, um, just relax. It's not about winning. Get out there and have some fun. And uh, really, it's going to be fine. Because in my experience, winning is not that hard. <laughs> it's not that hard. It's going to be fine. So hopefully that didn't jinx them. You can say a little prayer on their behalf. Um, OK, Pete's tweets. Last week, Caleb Smith covered 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. And he said, it said that we who have believed in Christ have been born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And picking it up in verses 4 through 7, that we have been born also into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, 
may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it looks like uh, Pete has gone over his character limit for Twitter. This is why I don't do Twitter, because conciseness is not for everyone. Let's pray over these verses. Lord Jesus, we thank you for our living hope. We thank you for an inheritance that is ready to be made revealed when you appear. I ask you that you would release new faith in us as we read your word, that we would take it in, that your Holy Spirit would unfold its meaning to us, and that we would step in and trust you fully. And I ask, Lord, if there's anything that I um, am not meant to say, that that word, when it goes out, that it would just not be planted, and that only your words would go out and be planted this morning. Um, I just ask that you guard our hearts and our minds as we take in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first thing um, is that last time I preached, I got some really good feedback on my Bible chart from most people, not from everyone. But um, since you loved it, I thought I'd bring you a little something new. Jason, should we show him our map, the Bible map today? So when Peter is writing this letter, he's we think he was probably writing from Rome, and he's writing to all of these, um, the region over here that's in red, which is modern-day Turkey, probably in the year um, 62 AD is what they think. And it's crazy how in just 30 years since Pentecost, the church has really spread. And there are well-established churches in all of these regions, and they believe that the church spread so fast because um, for one thing, because of persecution. So as early on as the stoning of Stephen in the book of Acts, people had been watching these followers of Jesus. They were willing to be tortured. They were willing to die for Christ rather than to deny him as Lord. And they were forgiving and merciful to their persecutors. It was profound. It was inexplicable. And the faith that these Christians had in Jesus Christ made people very curious, and they drew near to hear the gospel, and many of them believed, and the church just grew like wildfire. They went around proclaiming Christ alone as Lord, and then Rome doubled down against the church, and many fled from the center of persecution. And so they're just all over the place right now, but persecution is still, has still followed them. And it's one of the reasons, the primary reason that Peter is writing this letter to them, to encourage them. They were outsiders. Peter called them exiles in um, verse 1. And it wasn't just a few individuals experiencing hardship. It was collectively as a whole Christian community. It was like everywhere you turn, you learn that this faithful brother has just been put in prison. And this dear couple that you love had all their possessions and their home confiscated. And this sweet sister was harassed in the marketplace and they wouldn't let her buy anything. And you know, you're meeting in secret with two, three, four people in your home and you don't know that your neighbors won't inform on you. And um, so it was just a time of real testing of their faith. And it was wearing them down and Peter saw that, he knew that, and, and they were wondering, is it worth it? Is this life in Christ worth it? And Peter, along with all of the writers of the New Testament, it's a huge theme in these letters. They keep saying, it's worth it, it's worth it. Stay the course, hold fast, and remember that the gospel that you have been saved into is one in which the Lord Jesus endured suffering for the joy set before him. And then he sat down at the right hand of the Father, and you also now, following the Master, are going through temporary, albeit really, really painful, but it's temporary suffering, and you're following him into ultimate glory. The temporary, temporary will give way to the eternal. And they took the message in, and they did persevere. And how do I know? Because we're still here today. We're still here we're still persevering through the various trials in our faith. Peter says, you can take joy in this. Verse 4, that you have been born to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, 
unfading, and it is kept in heaven for you. So what is this inheritance that he's talking about? Jesus came to introduce the kingdom of God to us. Jesus said in Matthew, he said, seek first the kingdom of God. He's always talking about the kingdom in the book of Matthew and the kingdom that we're going to inherit. He said, seek first the kingdom of God. And he said this so that in seeking it, we would find it. And that in finding it, we would enter it. And that in entering it, we would inherit it. Matthew 25, verse 34 says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Colossians 1.12 says, Your faith, your faith, not any good works, not anything you've done, your faith has qualified you to share in this inheritance. Romans 8.17 says, We are co-heirs with Christ that we share in his sufferings now and we will share in his glory in eternity. And just as this inheritance is being kept safe for you, you are being kept safe for it. Verse 5, by God's power you are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. What is this salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time? I mean, haven't I already been saved when I put my faith in Jesus? Wasn't it a done deal? He said it is finished. I'm in, right? So what, what is this salvation that's ready to be revealed at a later time? So in Scripture, um, you'll come across passage, passages that will say you have been saved, and then there are passages that say you are being saved, And then you'll see passages that say you will be saved. And so these are three aspects of our salvation. The first one, when we put our faith in Jesus initially, that is the justification aspect of our salvation, meaning we are freed from the penalty of sin. And we are brought into his family, and no one can snatch us out of his hand. We are with him forever. We are saved. And then we enter into the second aspect, which is, sanctification. We are being saved day by day from the power of sin in our lives right now. So freed from the penalty of sin, now we're being sanctified. And in 1 Peter verse, um, chapter 1, verse 1, it says we're being sanctified again through faith for obedience to Christ. And this is that progressive salvation that we're experiencing day by day. It doesn't change our justification. Does that make sense? This is solid. Sanctification is something that we continue on in faith. And then the third aspect of our salvation is glorification. When we see Jesus face to face, in 1 John it says we will be like him. Colossians 3, 4 says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, you will appear with him in glory. And this is the fullness of our salvation. When we are glorified with him, we will be free from the presence of sin for all of eternity. So free from the penalty of sin, free from the power of sin in our lives today, and ultimately free from the presence of sin. It's really amazing. And um, on that day, we'll see him face to face. Right now, we see that reality through faith, We see it dimly, but one day we will see it face to face. And we are being guarded for it. It is ready to be revealed now. Um, It is ready now to be revealed, and we are being guarded for that time when we see Jesus. So what are we being guarded from? Do you remember when Jesus was praying in the garden for us before his crucifixion in John 17, 15? And he said, Father, I don't ask you that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them safe from the evil one. So the enemy is out to kill and steal and destroy. And we feel his threat, and we sense the danger, and we will have trouble, Jesus said. But it is God's power that is guarding us. It's not the measure of your faith that's guarding you, It's not that when your faith is big, then God's power is big to guard you. And it's not that when your faith is fragile, that God's power is somehow diminished in in keeping you. 
Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, that's that justification, that initial peace, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So you, were, you believed, and you were sealed, and his power guards you. And Jude chapter 1, verse 24 says that he is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you blameless before his glorious presence with great joy. And in verse 6, Peter says, In this you rejoice, though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. These various trials, you know, specifically for, for the Christians that he's writing to, it has a lot to do with persecution. But various trials encompass all of the things that we experience just living on a cursed planet in a fallen world because of sin. You know, natural disasters and sickness and disease and aging and um, pain and accidents, the effects of my sin the effects of your sin against me, the effects of our sin on our planet. Um, and I think this passage really speaks to the distinctly Christian doctrine of suffering having a purpose. It's very foreign to our values as a culture and our ideology and our philosophy to think um, that suffering has a purpose. We tend to think of it as just very random and senseless, and, and there's no meaning to it. So just thinking about in terms of our pluralism and our relativism in our society, that if there's no absolute truth to hold to, then, you know, we just kind of have our personal truth. But when it hurts, when it is confusing, when it's excruciating, then it's time to find a new personal truth so that we can get some relief, so that we can get some kind of personal fulfillment with the time that we have here on earth. And so we can just kind of bail out and grab onto something new and hope that it, that it offers something. And we believe in our culture that happiness is a fundamental right, and so we avoid pain and discomfort at all costs. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't seek to alleviate suffering. That's part, of, that's part of what Christians do. In fact, in the early centuries when plagues broke out, um, it was the Christians who stayed behind. Everyone was fleeing the cities, and the Christians stayed behind and cared for their loved ones and for their neighbors who were suffering with the plague, and they were willing to die. And people saw that as a testimony um, to the realness of God to his goodness. So it's not, that we're not to met, uh, it's not that we're not supposed to try to alleviate suffering, but because this is our idea of the highest good, is to be happy and not to suffer, um, we simply can't conceive of an all-powerful God, an all-loving God, who would allow suffering. This is one of the major objections to the Christian faith. It's known as a defeater. It's so powerful an objection that people use it very effectively to shut down a conversation about Christ. It's so powerful an argument that there's this um, theoretical astrophysicist, his name is Neil deGrasse Tyson. I don't know if you guys have seen him on PBS or whatever. I actually really like him. I think, I think he has a lot of interesting things to say, but he says this is his personal reason why he can't believe in the God of the Bible. Because he can't fathom an all-loving God, an all-powerful God who would allow us to suffer. To him, it's senseless. To him, it's random. And I think it's really interesting because he's always saying in his programs, he's always telling us, you can't know anything for sure. You can't draw any conclusions about truth unless it's based on verifiable empirical evidence, but notice that his objection to the God of the Bible is not a scientific one. It's a philosophical one. 
because he has a soul, and his soul is asking real questions. They have real answers, um, just not scientific ones. But if you shut out, if you're only willing to look at the natural and you shut out the revelation of the supernatural, you miss out on the answers. And that's what he has done. Um, so we have a soul. We have real questions. Some of us seek spiritual answers. And one place that we seek for it, perhaps, is in Buddhism, which appeals to many spiritual seekers. But they also can't reconcile suffering with a personal loving God. And so Buddhism grew out of a philosophy that suffering exists because we have desires that can't be fulfilled. The goal is to detach from desire and follow you know, the Eightfold Path, earn your way to a state of not existing because somehow not existing is better than this cycle of suffering. Um, and I think that perhaps this is why Buddhism has a very minimal music tradition. It's very muted. There is a musical tradition, but it's, it doesn't have much in the way of melody. It's, you know, bells and drums and chanting, but it's not full of joy, and it's not full of hope. It's meant to facilitate my detachment from my desire, not fulfillment of desire. And to me, that's not comforting at all. And, you know, I'm saying all of this with total respect, total respect. I'm just, um, you know, this is part of what we're doing as, as believers is we're ready to give a defense for the hope that is within us. And as we come across these other ideas, we have to bring it back and go, does this line up with what we believe from Scripture? Um, and so I hope you hear my respect in that. So one might say, well, it's too bad that you're not comforted. Life is suffering, and you just have to face the fact. Grow up. Face the facts. Again, with all due respect, you don't have to tell followers of the cross of Jesus to face the fact of suffering. Christians are the ones who own up. We have admitted that we, as a human race, rebelled against God, that we are the cause of the train wreck. We're the reason the whole city collapsed on top of us and we're buried alive. But God had compassion because he's all loving and God had capacity because he's all powerful to launch a cosmic rescue mission that required him to come down into it where we were. We were buried under the debris and the rubble. We were crushed and unable to breathe. And he came and walked through every square inch of our existence, and he suffered our consequences, and he suffered our death. And Jesus understood that suffering is not random, and it's not meaningless. Suffering was necessary. It was necessary in order to bring many sons and daughters to glory, is what it says in Hebrews 2.10. So we believed him, and he brought us back to life. But we still have a journey ahead. And he said, it's going to seem dark at times, but I'm the light. It's going to be very painful at times, but I have peace for you. And he said, trust me, follow me. Peter understood this. So when Jesus reinstated Peter after Peter had denied him three times, and, and Jesus brought him back and did the whole, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? And he reinstated Peter. Jesus said to him, when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. We follow Jesus. And in doing so, we face the fact of suffering and we find comfort and hope and peace and joy in the midst of it. And this is why we do what the world cannot do. In losing our life, we find it. That's why Christians can't stop singing. Ever noticed how many of our worship songs talk about suffering and joy as though they are intertwined? 
in Christ? It's because they are. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. All my days, yes, I will. And Peter says in verse 7, that all of this is so that the tested genuineness of our faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may, begin, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So this testing, this is not like a final exam. This isn't pass or fail. I, I just saw this horrible meme, and it said something like, when you're being tested and you think, God is being silent. Just remember that the teacher is always silent during a test. And I just thought, that's no wonder so many of us are so confused and scared as Christians when we hear stuff like that, that God is testing us to see if our faith is genuine. That is not what this is about. Um, Peter said that... Um, Peter was likening this whole process to a refiner's fire that um, when, so it's, a kind, it's the testing of the purifying process that gold is subjected to by a goldsmith. So there's this ancient me method of refining that involved a craftsman sitting next to a really, really hot fire with molten gold in a crucible being stirred and being skimmed to remove the impurities that rose to the top of the molten metal. With flames reaching temperatures of over 1,000 degrees Celsius, I don't even know what that is in Fahrenheit, this was a really dangerous job, a really dangerous occupation for the gold refiner. And so he's not subjecting you to a process and then leaving the room and coming back in when the timer dings. He is sitting with you, intimately involved in the entire affair, He's sitting next to the fire in our trials, allowing those elements that aren't gold, our doubts, our fears, our grumblings, our outright statements of unbelief. He doesn't say, oh, this isn't pure gold, throw this batch out. He patiently, skillfully removes those things. Um, part of the reason... Here are the reasons that our faith is so extremely precious to God. The first one is that our faith allows us now to take hold of all of his precious promises for us and his provisions. We're told in scripture that he has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And it is through faith that we grab hold of them. It is through faith that we appropriate and make it our own, his joy his peace, his comfort, his courage. Our faith is precious to God. Another reason our faith is so precious to God is that it glorifies him and it displays the truth about his invisible kingdom that is ready to be revealed. Our faith allows us to see it now and we are the window to the world that they can look at us trusting God um, having joy in our, in our pain because of what Christ has done for us, and we're the window that they can look and see through, they can see God is real. That's why our faith is precious to God. And another reason our faith is precious to God, it says it right here, is that it results in praise and glory and honor. So this is not about, in this process of being refined, it's really not about um, having a stronger faith. You know, put a good face on it. Just buck it up and, and be strong. Um, it's really interesting when I was learning about, about all of this. The gold is an extremely soft metal, which is why it is combined with other metals in the first place. So the higher the proportion of other metals combined with it, the harder the gold gets, which is why they do it. And that's why gold holds its shape. If you're making jewelry or whatever, it holds because of those other, because it's an alloy with other metals. But God doesn't want our hearts hard. 
He doesn't want our hearts hard like flint. He wants our hearts soft. He wants our hearts malleable. When gold has been refined, it can stretch, it can be molded, and pure faith like gold, it can meet this situation, it can meet this situation, it can do this in any situation. And it might be with tears running down our faces, and, but it can. It, and if it, can't, if it can't do this in any situation, it can do this in any situation. And if it can't do this, it can do this. Gaze, our, our gaze at the Father is what our faith is. A.W. Tozer has this great quote, and I didn't write it down, but see if I can remember it. He says, If faith is the gaze of the heart at God, um, and if this faith, something about, if this, this faith is the gaze of the heart at God, and that's why it's one of the, the easiest things that we can do, um, because it's just about looking at him. And it would be like God, he said, to make the most vital thing easy and place it within the range of possibility for the weakest and the poorest of us. And there was, um, there's a pastor, his name is Andrew Brunson. I don't know if you guys have heard of him. He was um, serving in Turkey as a pastor for 20 years or so, and he had this sweet congregation of 25 people. And in 2018, he was imprisoned, and they accused him of espionage or something, and they put him in prison, and he was there for two years, and he was in solitary confinement for quite a bit of the time. And he said that in the darkest, lowest moments, he was so miserable at times, he was so scared, he was so lonely, and at the darkest times, you know, he couldn't even lift his head, but he could lift his eyes. And he likened it to the face of a sunflower that just throughout the day just follows the sun like this. And that in his darkest moments, he could do that. And that was his rejoicing. So our rejoicing, it might not look like dancing. It might not even look like singing. It might just, looking, be, it might just look like looking at the face of Jesus. It might be through tears and snot running down our faces. In Jesus' case, it was sweating blood. But he showed us how to say, your will be done because you've set joy before me. One example for me of being in a, um, in a dark place, a very, one of my various trials, um, probably the hardest one for me in my life was losing my dad unexpectedly when I was 15 years old. That was definitely the worst. I learned through that loss what Psalm 73, verse 28 says, that the nearness of God is my good, that he is a refuge. But I wasn't in any kind of major suffering when I studied this passage. Um, it was all, my thoughts about it were just kind of all up in the realm up here about it. And these are all things that I believe in my head and in my heart. I believe these things. But then my faith was tested, maybe in a small way, this week as I was preparing. So my husband, Mike, um, was in a lot of physical pain this week, and I won't go into the details. He's going to be fine, but it was really hard to watch. And I had just been learning all of this about suffering and, and crafting this message about rejoicing in suffering. And it just felt like my faith was tested in that. It was really hard to watch. We, neither of us could sleep. Um, we tried this. We tried that. I'm doing everything I know to alleviate his pain. And I'm praying, and I'm crying, and I'm asking God, why? And please, 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 God. And when we've tried just about everything, and he's, it looks like he's just resigned himself to... The pain is going to last a while. Um, he turned on the, the book of Matthew on his audible Bible, and he just listened to Jesus. 
And I just was crying about it because that's so beautiful to me. It teaches me what it looks like to set our hope on the joy that is set before us. We've all suffered various trials, pain and hardship and loss and loneliness. And for millions of our brothers and sisters right now, it's very dangerous to live for Christ. Um, that, that region that we were showing you on the map, that modern-day Turkey is, I think it said, the 25th most dangerous place right now to live for Jesus, where people are, are still being taken to prison. They're still losing their lives. They're still um, persevering in the face of tremendous persecution. And we don't know that it won't be the case for us at some point, too. But no matter what our circumstances are, we know that he is keeping our inheritance for us and that he is keeping us for our inheritance. And that is something that we can rejoice in. Paul says in Romans 8:18, 8, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Another thing that Andrew Brunson said, Pastor Andrew Brunson said about his time in prison. Um, it was an encouragement to the rest of us. And he said that he believes that one of the best ways that we can prepare our hearts for whatever suffering may come is to invest our lives in being loved by Jesus and in loving him in return. He said this because we're willing to suffer for those that we love. We're willing to suffer for those that we love, just like Jesus did for us. And this fits perfectly with the last verse in our passage, verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So as we go to the table this morning, every week we... Um, we remember what Jesus has done for us and we take this little cracker that represents his body broken for us and we take this little cup of juice which represents his blood spilled for us and we remember his love. And we love him because he first loved us. I love to think that when Jesus endured the cross, um, it wasn't so much the physical suffering that was the worst for him, although it was horrendous. It was being separated from his father. In all of eternity, Jesus had, had never been separated from the father. And in that moment, he knew he was going to have to face that the father was going to reject him for our sin. And on the cross, he didn't cry out, it's too painful, it's too painful, make it stop. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he did this so that in our suffering, we could always say, my God, my God, you will never forsake me. We have followed Jesus into his death, into his life, into his resurrection, and we now have a living hope and an inheritance soon to be revealed. And in this, we rejoice.